Hello, hello, welcome everyone. I can see a few more people joining. Almost 60 people, which is incredible. But taking into account how we know how things are busy right now. Um, so we really appreciate you guys joining us as well. Hopefully you'll find this webinar quite insightful and useful as well. We'll be full of practical advice, but we'll go to that in a second as well. Just one more minute and then we'll get started. Okay, let's do this. It's one minute past 12.30. This webinar is about to begin. Thank you so much again for everyone um, that joined. Um, yeah, let's get started. Sabrina, plop. So uh, before we actually go into the depth of the webinar, we'll, let's just go into some housekeeping. So this session is being recorded. So um, don't worry if you need to jump off. The webinar will be shared to everyone that registered to attend as well. And obviously, please feel free to use the uh, Q&A box to ask any questions while we go along. At the end, we'll try to go through your questions as well. Um, but it's not guaranteed that we'll get all of these questions answered as well, just because we're a bit short on time. Um, and then last but not least, yeah, please um, fill in the survey once you finish the, the webinar, once you close the, the, this webinar um, tab, you will be asked to fill in a couple of questions. This help us um, make sure that obviously we get your feedback if we need to improve on certain areas, uh, what we need to do next uh, as well. Um, again, thank you for joining us. I'm now uh, gonna uh, introduce you to the wonderful uh, presenter, Sabrina. Hello, everyone. Thanks for spending time with us and your lunchtime, in fact. We know that's valuable. Um, so I'm the product marketing manager at Birdie. So I don't know if you are using Birdie. I'm sure you've seen my name pop around. But if I haven't met with you before, it's lovely to see um, your names and your faces. Um, but I'm responsible for marketing the wonderful things that we are building over here um, and showing you the best way to use it. Um, but today we're going to go through uh, what we've heard to you about inspection day from you. What are some of the biggest struggles? What are the biggest points of confusion? And then we're going to bring it back to basics, you know, reviewing the five Chloe's, what they mean, uh, demystifying um, what you can do to surface evidence for each of those, um, some, some different ways that you can prepare evidence, whether it's through Birdie or another software provider or tool and the things and stuff that you can take today to just make things a bit um, more calm and easy breezy when moving into any inspection. Um, and like Sim said, at the end, we'll reserve some time for some questions, but um, feel free to pop them in the chat so we can keep track of them. Um, if we can't respond at the end, we'll make sure to review with you afterwards and find some um, additional time. Perfect. Um, just to check if everyone knows where the chat box is, it should be at the uh, bottom of your screen. Can, I, can we just do a quick test? Who here has been inspected in the last six months? Can we have a yes or no in the chat? Just to make sure it's working. Okay, Hi, here it Andrew. is. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's working, good. Sorry, Sabrina, over to you again. That's okay, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks for the participation. We love to see it, we love to see the energy. Um, so uh, the last thing that I want to say before we get into it, can you see my screen? It seemed to, there we go. Um, the last thing I wanna say is again, don't worry if you're using paper, if you're using Birdie, if you're using another tool, we want you to walk away um with the best tips and strategy and feeling calm that you know what to do um, if someone were to inspect you tomorrow so um just keep that in mind um and again ask questions along the way so let's take a look at this slide um so correct me if i'm wrong but when we speak to um a lot of our partners and other agencies um they often tell us that it's really hard to evidence the amazing work that they're doing. And it's also hard to make sense of um, what actually is required for each of the Chloe's. 
And you can see why when you look at this particular slide, this is the information or the high level overview that you're given from the CQC in terms of what you need to do to um, achieve um, a particular good or outstanding rating, what are the areas um, that they're um, kind of measuring against, um, and what do you need to do uh, in order to be prepared and be ready for, for each of those inspections. And again, so if you take a look at this, it's no wonder that people come to us saying that they're overwhelmed or confused and don't really know what best practice is, um, because I certainly get distracted by this and, and find it a bit confusing to understand. Um, so again, we really want to, to end today with a, a clearer kind of demystified understanding of, of what this all means. So I'd love to, to hear from you, you know, feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, I can't see the chat right now, so I'll have the lovely Sim review, but, um, you know, what today do you find the most overwhelming when it comes to um, a particular kind of inspection or uh, evidencing a particular Chloe? We'd just love to, to hear from, from you all, you know, what has been the most challenging thing, especially when it comes to interpreting what this all means. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'll go on. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we, we have okay. many questions right now. No worries. Cool. So the one thing that I want to say is that, you know, the stress of preparing for an inspection, uh, should, like those stressful days should be limited and it shouldn't be such a tall, unconquerable mountain when it comes to understanding what each of the Chloe's is, um, how to make sure that you're providing the right evidence that you're going into any inspection set up for success. Um, in fact, it's no longer the case that, um, you know, care providers or agencies like yours need to spend days rifling through paperwork, throwing out everything out of the file cabinet to try and um, showcase the evidence that, of the care that they're delivering day in, day out. Um, so one of the first things that really want to stress here is um, the, the CQC and of course the NHS has set out this guidance as well is that it's important to try and move towards a centralized digital um, um, base so having a centralized record of all the care that you're delivering day in day out being sure to document everything that you're doing the steps that you're taking to deliver care um, respond to any actions or concerns in real time the one thing that I would stress is that the this biggest step one that you could do is transfer <laughs> into the digital sphere and, and get that kind of foundational element in place. Um, the one thing that it's important to, to understand is with Birdie, um, you know, as an example, it's important to showcase that it's not just a replication of the paper processes, it's looking for a tool that has been built in a way um, that really keeps those kind of areas of guidance and CQC requirements at the core of everything that they're doing. So when you're looking at, say, an EMAR provider or uh, something to help with your care assessments, does it keep these CQC guidance in mind? Um, is it going to help you measure, um, you know, your progress and, and keep data that is able to easily surface, um, you know, the, the information that you're inputting and bring it in a very easy to digest and, and serviceable way so that you're ready to pull it at any second that an inspection is to happen. And again, it's all well and good to have um, a piece of technology that provides you with the tools to get to outstanding. Um, but one of the other things that I want to stress is that it does start with you documenting that information. Um, so again, you're delivering an amazing care already and you're doing all the you're taking all the right steps. Um, but documenting everything, document, document, document is, is definitely going to be one of the keys of success today. And again, the one thing I hope this gives a bit of sense of calm after those um, those last couple of slides, but the one thing again is we want to make sure that we're keeping this as simple as possible for you and demystifying all of these Chloe's. So again, our goal is to eliminate the last minute panic and stress of preparing and, and trying to surface all of this information so that you're having the foundations and the right practice in place to walk into any inspection prepared for anything and at any time. So really excited and thanks again for being with us. So the other thing that I want to say is after you've been documenting and having you have those foundations in place and you're recording all the information that um, across your agency, be it the delivery of care, the punctuality, staff training, et cetera, um, would say that it's really important to keep a pulse on everything that's going on 
and seeing how well you're performing across your agency, whether it being um, a constant review of, say, um, secure call monitoring, how you're stacking up against visit punctuality, how you're keeping track from medication administration, being able to find something or a partner or software that is able to help you surface that information and measure that progress in an easy to use and understand way. So again, keeping uh, a track of the health of your agency and how that is measuring against particular guidance um, and, and CQC CLOE requirements. Um, I'm sure other providers um, will help with this. Um, Birdie is able to perform like a health score report. So based on all the information that you're inputting the system, it aligns with each of the five Chloe's. We give a, a fun score against four for each of those four being the highest um, kind of measuring against um, um, outstanding, requ good, out requires improvements and the like, um, making it easy to prog take progress of how you're doing and if there's anywhere that you need to improve. But again, would say that, you know, no matter what, uh, what way it's surfaced or what report it's coming in, again, trying to keep a pulse of what's going on and keeping progress on the health of your agency is going to be really key here. I should have clicked to the next slide. So let me know. Once. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. Great. So we can get right into it then. So the we're getting into the meat of it all. So caring. Um, so when talking about CQC requirements, everyone all uh, tends to talk about them in the order at which they appear on the website or the CQC guidance. We're going to switch it up today and talk with caring because for me, um, this is foundational to, to all the clothes and everything that you're doing um, as a, a care business. Um, so what the CQC says, so I'm just going to read out this quote here. This is pulled directly from um, CQC guidance, but by caring, we mean that the service involves and treats people with compassion, kindness, dignity, and respect. Um, so this is something, there are a lot of subpoints that ladder up to this, as I'm sure you've seen and have reviewed the, the documentation. Um, there are a lot of C.1s, C.2s, um, but here the, the big thing that you wanna showcase is that you are a caring agency um, and we happen to have pulled a cheat sheet together kind of breaking down what this all means. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide. So here's that infamous breakdown that I was talking about. Um, so essentially the underpinning principle of caring um, uh, and of all Chloe's is ensuring that you're delivering the best care possible to those within um, your agency or underneath um, your, um, your care delivery. Um, and care teams might need to learn certain practices, um, have certain training to make sure that they're operating more safely and more caring and keeping that compassion at the core of everything they do. Um, and one of the first things that the inspector is going to want to see is prove that training and that policy that has been given and reviewed by your staff. So the first three buckets here, training policies and culture, are going to be the three points of data um, or kind of main buckets of information that any inspector is going to want to review. Um, so the first thing, like I said, training. So, you know, being able to evidence that your team has been onboarded in a way um, that showcases how you as an agency prioritize that caring element of, of your agency, the caring element and the compassion of the care that you're providing. And again, I know every, each and every one of you is um, keeps that at the core of everything that you do, but being able to document that. Um, again, you'll probably hear um, this sound like a broken record, but um, when it comes to training, would recommend here um, that you're keeping a some kind of document, be it a report, a spreadsheet, a centralized um, base where you have the name of your care, um, your cares, um, your hair professionals, um, what training that they've gone through, what policies they've reviewed, the date that it is reviewed, and when it comes to training, the date that that is set to expire. Um, again, the inspector is going to want to see proof of all that and making sure that you're keeping on track of that and staying compliant with the trainings that are required. Um, so I'd say that's a really, really crucial step to, to this one. Um, and of course, any kind of Chloe that requires training at the core of it. Any questions so far? Cool. Um, on the policy side of things, similar. So making sure, um, again, like I said, with training, a review of any kind of misconduct policy, um, especially focusing on keeping dignity and respect at the core of the care that you're delivering. And when it comes to culture, um, proof that you're continually asking for feedback, whether it's from the care recipient themselves, family members, the health professionals who are involved, and keeping that feedback to continually personalize and kind of evolve the, the care plan, the assessments that are put in place, um, and, and again, keeping their needs and um, them center to, to everything that you're doing when it comes to that delivery of care. 
Um, you'll see a fun little cake emoji or icon here, um, but that's just an example to showcase that examples are the icing on the cake when it comes to um, your inspection or your audit. So after you've gone and showcased all of this information, you've surfaced this data, you know, you're always going to want to try and showcase um, where possible examples and real life stories of um, ways that you've been able to showcase positive feedback or kept kind of compassion and care at the center of what you're doing. So when it comes to caring, it's incredibly important that, you know, no, what, no matter how you're doing this, be it paper, um, another software provider or with Birdie, um, you're um, enabled to showcase that your care and compassion is shining through. So being able to easily showcase how you're keeping compassion and care and dignity at the core of everything that you're doing. So um, here you wanna be able to um, wanna really stress that it's important to showcase um, core elements of um, the preferences, the needs, the goals, as well as kind of um, additional kind of background information of any care recipient that you have across your agency. Um, Birdie happens to use something um, that we call about me. So here you can log um, key information about um, background, sexuality, life history, preferences, how someone likes their tea, for instance, or if they have a particular walking route that they like. Again, keeping those kind of personalized human elements at the core of your care so that you can go in, um, you know, break the ice, strike a conversation and really paint that full picture of the care recipient. So again, we'd recommend no matter how you're documenting this to keep all of this information at the core of what you're doing and being able to easily surface that you're keeping record of, of these preferences and having that inform your assessments and your care plan and, and how you're delivering that care. Um, and of course, you want to also encourage your carers to share insights and feedback over time. If there are any changes or feedback from the care recipient, you want to be able to continue to evolve and keep that feedback front of mind um, and be able to evidence that you're, you're documenting and keeping track of that feedback. And again, it's not just about typing up those words. So similar, like I said, when it comes to feedback, you want to be able to, to take those words and that feedback and put it into action. Um, so again, whether it's, um, you know, um, showing an audit trail or editing this live, it's meant to be a living document and a living kind of um, piece of information to showcase that, again, you're, you're continuing to evolve your care as the needs and kind of preferences of your care recipient are evolving. So we have some fun little transition animations here. So I'll just click through these and get them out of the way. Perfect. Uh, before I get into that, would love to, I think, put in the chat any kind of things that you're finding particularly um, um, difficult about evidencing, um, you know, caring um, as a Chloe or any kind of stories that you have found to be really successful. Um, you know, Sim can read them out if if he finds something. Um, um, that you'd be willing to share, but I'll just go into a case study um, in the meantime. Um, so when it comes to caring, we give a ton of examples, but I'll keep it to one because we only have so much time. Um, and I'm, um, but so one of the things we want to showcase through is a couple of the ways um, one of our partner agencies was able to take off um, um, four kind of core elements of the caring Chloe in one. So on the um, C.14, do staff know and have um, the respect for the people they're caring for and supporting? Are they keeping preferences, um, personal stories, backgrounds, and potential front of mind? 1.6, do staff understand and promote compassion um, and respectful and empathetic behavior within their, um, within their team? Um, do staff recognize when people want different and need different support from, from their care? Um, and does the service give the staff time and training? Um, so again, all the things that I walked through above are going to be really core ways to showcase um, these four um, sub aspects of the Chloe. Um, but one of our agency, um, just to give an example, uh, when they were um, when they had a particular care recipient, they noticed that he was tearing paper in different kind of pieces and uh, apart every time they were going to to perform a call or um, log into a call, and they kept on a record of that and they logged every time they saw that. Um, and through building that relationship, they were able to identify that. Um, this particular care recipient used to be an engineer, actually. And so he liked, you know, playing around with things. He liked getting his hands um, occupied and, and um, trying to create different things. And so um, after having that conversation, they updated um, their particular um, about me profile, about the care recipient, logged this um, previous occupation for every care in the care team to see and view. Um, and after doing that, they had a brainstorm as a team thinking through, hey, what can we do um, um, for this? And 
they had the ingenious idea to give um, this particular care recipient puzzles. And so rather than having this behavior of carrying papers, they had things to um, in puzzles to keep him occupied. And now every time that they see them um, playing with a puzzle or performing that, are able to log that in Birdie um, and also share that update with the family members as well. So again, really keeping, again, showcasing how you're keeping that conversational element and that kind of building relationship element at the core of what you're doing, being able to flag any kind of background or preferences into that care plan um, and continue to involve. So I hope, um, hope that resonates with you. Um, and again, you know, feel free to share stories in the chat, but I thought that was such a, a great story to share with you all. Cool. So that is the end of caring. Um, again, I think it's fundamental to just keep, you know, the care recipient at the core of what you're doing here. And hopefully this has shed some light on some of the, the best practices that you can do, uh, whether it comes to giving your team and your train um, and the training in place and policies in place um, to keep your staff at the ready um, um, when it comes to compassionate care. Um, and keeping preferences at the core of what you're doing and the delivery that they're doing. So number two, effective. So when it comes to servicing evidence for the effect of Chloe, the CQC here, and I'm just gonna read this again, um, uh, by effective, we mean that care, treatment, and support achieves good outcomes, helps you maintain quality of life, and is based on the best available evidence. So this one is all about using the evidence that you have to, to define tailored outcomes for each and every single care recipients um, within your care. So again, you know, the first step is to identify what are the things that they're looking to get out of um, being with you as an agency? What are realistic outcomes that can be achieved within the specific time period that they happen to be under your care? And what are the steps needed to take action and, and meet those outcomes wherever possible? So again, that is really kind of breaking it down here. Um, so breaking it down. So again, <laughs> there's a millions of points to each of this, but at a high level, we wanted to break it down and do some kind of easier to, to understand in, in uh, groupings and buckets. Um, so similar to the caring, um, um, Chloe, uh, number one is going to be evidencing training that you have in place. So again, broken record Sabrina um, would recommend having some kind of spreadsheet, digital document, um, digital record um, or report that is able to showcase the trainings that you have done when it comes to handling of specific service user needs. So in this case, an example that I have here here is you have a care recipient who um, is being treated for dementia, or is, um, you know, affected by dementia. Therefore, you'd need to have a care, um, a care professional who is trained and certified in that particular area of care. So you're keeping that central to the matching between care recipient and care professional. You have a record of when that training was conducted, when it's set to expire. So again, you're being compliant, but also keeping that specific service users needs at the core of what you're doing and deciding. And then again, continuing um, to build plans for how you can uh, continue to train your team, whether you have a calendar of upcoming trainings, but again, looking to make sure that you're giving the certifications and skills needed to make sure that your carers, uh, your care professionals are effectively doing their job. When it comes to care plans, um, another thing here is the personalized nature for, for every assessment and care plan that you're doing for each of your care recipients. So, you know, it's not going to be a copy and paste job, and I know that you're not doing that, um, but being able to evidence that it's personalized is really, really important here. So have you um, added additional kind of um, information or notes based on, um, based on why you've added a particular task for a care recipient, how you're meant to do this task? You know, if one of the tasks happens to be um, taking out, um, helping fold the laundry. Is there a particular way that this care recipient likes to fold their laundry? You know, it's little things like that that really go a long way to showcase that you're personalizing your care. Um, and again, the other thing is proof that your care recipient or a family member has approved that care. They've been kept at the core of that decision-making process and they have that autonomy and that voice. Um, so one way that you can do this is you know reviewing the care plan with them, walking side by side through all the decisions that you've made, um, but also using something like an e-signature um, to send out, showcasing that you have reviewed it, they have reviewed it, and you have documentation and proof that that has been signed off on and that they've been in that kind of core decision-making seat. 
Um, the other thing is um, showcasing that you have um, um, third-party access to key information. So, you know, are you able to keep, you know, a GP, a um, healthcare professional that is core to that care team of care recipients um, in the loop? Um, um, it, this may be possible in other softwares, um, but when it comes to Birdie, we happen to have something called third-party access. You can give a um, GP or authorized health professionals, um, you know, a particular access code, letting them go in, stay in the loop. Um, the also thing that I want to say is you want to be able to document that you're having that kind of conversation and updating any kind of information based on GPs, whether they're giving you a new medication prescription, you can upload that and it's really showcase that you're keeping that conversation going. And finally, again, icing on the cake, examples, proof points, stories of um, how you've been able to effectively deliver that care, how you've effectively personalized care plans, how you've involved someone in from a third party um, GP health perspective, the like. Again, I'm sure you have a boatload of stories. So, you know, being able to showcase this and have one at the ready is really important here. Any questions here or any kind of things that you find more confusing about the effective Chloe, feel free to put in the chat. Um, cool. So this is one of the things that I want to talk to you next. So when it comes to effective, it's really important to understand the needs and unique risk profile of an individual care recipient. So the first step that you want to do, and one of the things that will be key to showcasing that you are an effective agency, is performing a holistic assessment of the needs and risks of each and every one of your care recipients. Um, so this is going to be able to showcase that you truly understand and you've created a care plan based on the particular needs, outcomes, and goals that the care recipient is looking to achieve while being within your care. And again, that this has all been created with them in mind and in conversation with them and their needs. Um, so a holistic approach is important, again, because it takes everything into account. Um, when it comes to Birdie, we happen to have a needs and risk assessment that has built across um, um, eight different core areas uh, with additional places for you to highlight the outcomes that your care team will be looking to support your client to meet, um, a mix of structured, um, but also free text. You can you know, um, record something, um, but then personalize it with additional information. Like I was saying, recording the preference of how someone, what route they like to take their walk on. For instance, if that's one of their everyday um, routines, but also recording um, any kind of risks that are happening across um, that have arised as a result of their assessment and being able to showcase the, the steps needed to mitigate that. So keeping that core um, to everything that you do. And again, whether it be in Birdie or another platform, this is gonna be really important to showcase that you're an effective agency here. And of course, I'm gonna end it with a little Casey. So again, go through this quickly for you. There you go. Um, so an example of a way um, that uh, we've been able to help an, a partner agency kind of go through and effectively evidence for the effect of Chloe um, was across E1.3, E4, and E5 and 6. Um, so E4 says, how well do staff teams and services within and across organizations, um, you know, work together to deliver effective, safe um, um, support, uh, care, and treatment. Um, E5.1, how are people's day-to-day -day health and well-being, um, you know, being met and documented? And E6, how are people's individual needs met by the adaptation, design, and decoration of, of premises? So uh, one of our um, agencies in East England um, happened to be an elderly adult um, who had a history of chronic depression. They also had a fear of leaving their house. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, COVID definitely didn't help them wanting to leave the house. Um, and we, um, and one of the things that the, the team did was sit down um, once that person came within their care and really talk through what is the goal that they're looking to get out of this? What is, what is the thing that you're looking to achieve at the end of, of being within that agency's care? And the care recipient, you know, you know, despite having that fear of leaving the house, wanted to take the steps um, to to be able to to go out into the outside world um, and 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 take that big kind of leap out of their house. And so um, each day, the care care professional would have that task to ask and kind of prompt the care recipient, "Hey, do you want to go for a walk today? Do you want to do this outside?" Just to try and think through different steps and measures that could be taken to help meet that that um, outcome and that goal. 
Um, and there were a couple of, you know, a couple of weeks passed, a couple uh, months passed where, you know, the care recipient said no, but the, the care professional, the care team kept that at the core of everything they're doing. Um, and every visit, you know, that was something that was kept front of mind. Um, and one day, um, one of the care professionals on the team asked to go feed the ducks. And that happened to be the, the one thing that um, incentivized the, the care recipient to really get out um, and go for that stroll and leave their house. Um, and it was that kind of like, that rigor and that constant kind of looking after how we can help that care recipient achieve their goals that the agency really, really kept core to what they do. Um, and I just thought it was an amazing story to, to show how they've been able to, you know, define what that goal was, you know, um, stay diligent into taking the steps needed to meet that goal, but ultimately, you know, um, share that story with you all as well. Perfect. Can you see the next one? It's not popping up for me. Yes. Perfect. Can. Great. Um, so hopefully that has given you some insight into the effective side of things and you feel more comfortable. Um, the other thing that I want to get into now is um, responsive. So when it comes to the CQC, um, when they say responsive, they say that it means that services are being organized so that it meets the uh, people's needs, right? So with this one, um, the inspector wants to see evidence of, um, you know, changing and evolving to meet the needs of a particular care recipient, um, that you're being responsive to any kind of feedback or changes that are happening. Um, they're able to be quick on your toes, but also, again, evolve and continually review your processes in place, the care that's being delivered, and make sure that you're making sure that the, the care is responsive to the changing needs um, and risk profile of a particular care recipient. So again, you'll see that a lot of these Chloe's have some overlapping themes. So our hope here is that in having good practice and documenting and evidencing um, and just forming that really strong foundations for, um, for evidencing of other Chloe's, you'll be able to build upon that and kind of cross pollinate, if you will, um, various evidence um, um, across different Chloe's. So when it comes to responsive, breaking this down, um, we've again broken it down into three initial buckets and a final kind of example. Um, but when it comes to personalization, again, um, you really want to be able to, to give data or evidence that you know, you're, you're planning the delivery of care, you're planning the timing of visits, um, you're keeping the, um, you're keeping all of this according to the preferences and requirements of a particular care recipient. So for instance, if you know that they wake up at eight and they want to be able to be dressed and ready um, and um, um, ready before you're able to come in and deliver that call, um, so maybe they need about an hour of getting ready. You know, they requested that 9 a.m. is the time that they want their, their morning visit or their morning call to happen. You're keeping those things in mind. You're keeping their preferences and their routines in mind again when it comes to um, the personalization of their care and their visit schedule. The other thing, surprise, surprise, policies. Um, so keeping track of um, having an up-to-date complaints procedure. So let's say a care recipient, um, you know, isn't necessarily happy or is complaining about um, the, the care professional or a particular task that's being provided. They want it to be changed. They want it to be kind of responded to. It's important to have that, that procedure in place to showcase that um, you know, you're, you're keeping responsive to that complaint, you're updating the care plan or the care team based on that information that's been provided by the care recipients, but also that your team is trained on that policy as well. Um, and it's also important to showcase that your, your team is trained on the personal security and, um, and, and security requirements of the care recipients as well. And again, would recommend here having a, a um, record, a database, again, of who has reviewed this policy, when it was reviewed, um, and if you have a cadence in which it needs to be reviewed by. So you can easily quickly pull it out of your toolkit and say, here you go, inspector, I have this already for you, easy breezy, um, and, and feeling confident that, that this is ready to go. Um, great. The other thing um, that's important is, again, showcasing that they, your care recipient has a really clear understanding of the service that's going to be provided to them, um, as well as what is expected from your agency. So reviewing any kind of policy or um, contract in place, making sure that they've been able to make an informed decision and that they're going in with all the information that they could possibly need um, to, to effectively um, uh, agree to that this is the best agency and care plan for them. 
And again, finally, um, icing on the cake, examples and stories uh, where you've picked up on individual needs, um, you've noticed a change in their well-being or their behavior over time, and you've been able to update that care plan. Um, or for instance, an example, if they haven't been drinking as much, you know, taking adding a task to the care plan for the care professional to prompt to drink or take in some water. You know, it's those little things that will really go a long way to showcase that you're being responsive and continuing to update um, um, all at the all with keeping the care recipients and their needs at, at the center. Perfect. Um, great. So the other thing that I want to say is, um, and again, building on what I've um, you know, just walked through, it's important to continually review um, your existing assessments and care plans, making sure that the information that um, you've collected when you first assessed is either still accurate or it needs to be um, updated and evolved based on current kind of needs or feedback given from, say, a health professional or the care recipient and the wider kind of care team. Um, and again, you really want to evidence this is being reviewed on a regular basis. When it comes to CQC, I think their um, minimum suggested guidance is 180 days. Some agencies choose to do it as regularly as um, every 30 days, every 60 days. Um, but again, you really want to make sure that you're able to, to review this on a regular basis. Um, and when you do do that, you want to be able to showcase that um, easily and quickly. So again, keeping a record of who made changes and when. Um, with Birdie, we've built a review process directly into our assessment platform. Um, so when you're going in, you're reviewing, let's say, the needs assessment, for instance, you can see when it was first completed, um, when a review has been completed, and you can review the assessment, making changes as is, and recording that in real time um, so that you can, again, showcase that directly to any inspection uh, or inspector. So again, here, whether it be with Birdie or other, just again, being able to review that process, have some kind of process and, and regular schedule in place and being able to surface those changes and how often you've made those changes is gonna be really, really key for this one here. The other thing that's gonna be really important about um, the responsive Chloe is keeping the protected characteristics in mind as defined in the, um, the Equality Act. So these are things that the CQC has outlined, um, which is publishing guidance about sexual orientation, gender identity, asking clients what their preferred pronouns are, and keeping this at the core of, of your care, care plan as well. So you want to note down any kind of impact um, in the care needs that these characteristics may have on the care plan and the things that you've um, put in place. Um, and I think it's also really important to, to again, keep this as a, a active conversation in a way to get to know your care recipient as well. Um, and again, keeping this core to what you're doing. The way that we do that, going back to About Me, which I mentioned at the start of this, we have a section that's been built to directly record this. So sexuality, um, gender, and uh, pronouns, um, and making sure that this is, is core to what we do and easily accessible by the whole care team um, that is delivering care to this care recipient. But again, you know, um, recording this in some way digitally um, or on the care plan is going to be really important here um, as it's one of the core elements of, of this effective Chloe. Cool. Third one under our belts. How are we all feeling? Still with me? Still the energy? <laughs> We're on the penultimate one, which is safe. One of my one of my favorites. Definitely, definitely a heavy hitter. Tina says, all good. So I guess you, you are keeping them engaged. Thank you, Tina. Great. Thanks so much, Tina. <laughs> Perfect. So now we're on to safe. So again, reading this, um, you know, what CQC says is this regulation, she seeks to ensure that every one of your care recipients or everyone that's in your care is protected from abuse, abuse and avoidable harm. Um, so again, this is requiring the highest degree of safety, keeping safeguarding risk mitigation at the core of everything that you're doing as an agency. Um, and we'll get into this a, a bit later on, but a big, big, big component of that is going to be medication administration and making sure that you're putting the safeguarding practices in place for, for the accurate um, administration of medication. So let's break safe down. So again, we've bucketed this into a couple different groupings and again surprise training is going to be at the top of the evidence that is um, expected from any inspector so one of the first things that they're going to want to see is proof of safeguarding um, being training certification for every single member of your team um, so again here it's going to be really really critical to have that 
uh, what after <laughs> the last couple of times I've said this, a very, very long list of the training um, that you've delivered to your team, who has had that training, when it's been done, and if it needs to be re-reviewed or retrained on um, and when. Same thing, there's a bunch of different policies um, that is gonna be really, really critical to this safe um, Paul, um, safe Chloe. So anti having policies in place such as anti-abuse, safe working practices, the correct dispensing administration of medication, health and safety. I could go on and on, um, but these are the really core policies that are going to be expected to have been reviewed by your whole team. So again, within that training list, being able to showcase that they have reviewed it and when. Um, and again, if there's any kind of re-review process or timeline that you're keeping in track with your agency. Um, on the care plan side of things, again, you're going to want to have a personalized safety plan in place for your care recipients. So when it comes to this, um, whether it's understanding the potential risks that have been identified for a um, one of your care recipients, for instance, if there happens to be a staircase in their house that they need assistance with, or, um, or if, again, they're at risk of having an inadequate diet, you know, these are the things that you want to keep front of mind when it comes to defining the care plan and putting in the tasks or actions into place to mitigate those risks and keep that safety, their safety at the core of what you're doing and the care that you're delivering. And again, a story at the end, some kind of example um, is going to be really, really core here, icing on the cake um, to showcase how you've, um, you know, been able to lead safe practices across your agency. Um, an example of this, again, could be an example where a particular care professional was matched with a particular care recipient who had a specific kind of training or skill set requirement, because again, to give them effective and safe care, they needed uh, to have someone who was trained on that specific needs and, and um, um, and use case here. Perfect. So one big Chloe um, that falls under the safe CQC um, guidance or category is ensuring the, the proper and safe use and administration of medications um, where that service is responsible. So here, um, S4 encompasses this um, really, really big green check mark here because again, it's going to be front and center of, of this safe Chloe. Um, you want to make sure that you're um, storing them in the proper way, you're recording the administration of them in a proper way, uh, an appropriate way, and you're engaging with healthcare professionals regularly if there's any kind of change to that medication schedule, um, or for instance, if they have a PRN um, medication and, you know, they they aren't getting the expected outcome or, um, you know, you're looking to seek for um, guidance from them to understand, is this the right type of medication um, or is this the correct dosage, that kind of thing. So again, really keeping um, the, the safe, effective um, practice of, of medication administration at the core of what you're doing, but also liaising with um, particular healthcare professionals who are involved in this particular care recipients team um, to make sure that it is accurate and um, you know, raising for any kind of mitigation as actions as needed. So when it comes to S4, the previous Chloe that I spoke about, um, the one thing that you want to keep front of mind, um, and I think is going to go a very far step into evidencing that um, kind of safe practice is some kind of electronic medication administration record, so an EMAR. That's going to be one of the first fundamental steps that you're going to to do to evidence that safe administration of medication. You're able to review, um, review the administration. You're able to review trends across that administration, um, but also have that in an easy to surface and auditable way. EMAR at Birdie, for instance, was the, one of the first features that we built because it's so, so core to, um, to this Chloe, but also the, the safe delivery of, of any kind of care agency. Um, and, and it's such an important domain to get right. Um, because again, it's, you know, people's lives at stake and, and we took that seriously and we, we knew that we needed a, there was a better way to, to get this built and, and ensure that you were equipped with the breast tooling in place to, to make sure you were doing it right and safely. Um, so when it comes to this one, um, you know, by simply using a EMAR system, you know, it's, it's going to go a long way. So, you know, scheduling medications um, and keeping that in a digital way, in a consistently recorded way, you're going to be able to reduce risk of avoidable harm. Um, and with SAFE in particular, um, and with Birdie as, as an example, um, you know, any particular medication manager, um, you know, it's going to make it a 
bit easier and simpler to build out that schedule. Um, when it comes to Birdie, we happen to be connected to the NHS database of medicines, uh, DMND. So again, um, by having that kind of consistent record, whether it's nomenclature um, um, and that consistent kind of list to pull from, it's helping to reduce the risk of transcription errors because you have that consistent, um, consistent database to pull from and everyone is reading the same information. You can be rest assured that the medication name is correct. It's not written error or any kind of paper-based error. So again, one thing I would say is, you know, whether it's um, built into your system or you're referencing it yourself would definitely say keeping that consistent kind of medication nomenclature, making sure that you're accurately, um, you know, using the correct name, the correct kind of dosage of each of those medications that you're scheduling is gonna be key. Um, so I'd look for a system um, that is linking and using that and building that into their system as well. The last thing that I wanna say is um, being able to respond to any kind of concerns or alerts or accidents that are happening across your agency is going to be really, really key here. I don't know how you're currently dealing with this now, or if you have a, another provider, but I'm sure um, in the days of paper, you know, you were doing a lot of this through calls, texts, emails, paper, not air paper airlines, I kid, I kid, but um, you know, the, the thing here is that you wanna really be able to showcase um, that you're responding to the concerns that are raised in real time and having that really strong line of communication um, to, to be as responsive as possible to, to issues or accidents that are happening across um, your agency. So, and ultimately this is leading to the safe delivery of care of, of your care recipients and the people within your care. So when it comes to Birdie, we happen to have an alerts manager. So when your um, care professionals are out in um, delivering a visit, if they notice something uh, uh, wrong or if something has happened to happen, they can push um, and log a concern directly on their phone and that'll get posted in real time into the agency hub. And you'll see here that you're able to um, showcase um, the status um, review the severity level, as well as keep through a audit trail of all the steps that you've taken to um, mitigate that risk and resolve that risk. So no matter where you're doing this, you really want to be able to provide to any inspector, hey, we know that when a concern is raised or an accident happens, we have an effective process in place that keeps our care recipients safe. We mitigate any risk that has arised. Um, and we've also taken the steps needed in, in the event that something, um, an accident has happened or a care recipient is at risk of, um, of um, safeguarding or lack of safeguarding. So again, no matter how this is happening, again, being able to showcase and easily evidence that step-by-step -step and all the things that you've done um, to go, um, go above and beyond to ensure the safety of your care recipients is really, really crucial here. The one thing, again, is bringing back to training my favorite topic of today. Um, <laughs> so you want to, again, to keep track of the actions you're taking to ensure that your, um, your care recipients are safe. So again, keeping a central record of your team's training um, and making sure that they have a, um, you know, they're compliant with that training. You have an understanding of the upcoming expiry dates it's going to be really, really key here. Um, so when it comes to, when it comes to making the decision of, Hey, I have this new care recipient, they happen to have this need, um, dementia, for instance, I know that I have three care uh, professionals within my agency who are certified to effectively and safely deliver the care that that care recipient needs. And I can evidence that that is kept in mind for every care recipient that's brought into my agency or my business. That's going to be really, really important here when it comes to an inspection to showcase that you have that process in place, that these trainings are kept up to date, and you're keeping those trainings um, as a measure to safeguard the, the care of your client and the safety of your clients. Perfect. So going into a case study here, I'm just going to click through the animations. Perfect. So I will just do this one. I have a second case study, but I'll skip it due to time. But um, one of the agents, one of our partner agencies in Scotland was telling us how they ensure a smooth transition when taking on um, new care packages or even when someone comes back from hospital. So again, if you remember, um, um, you know, when it comes to CQC indicator 1.3, um, people's health benefits from their care and support um, 
um, as well as um, CY 2.2, quality insurance and improvement is led well. Um, you know, this is something that was kept core in mind as well as S4. So that really strong kind of de-risking and safeguarding of the correct medication administration um, and dosage is uh, really core to this one case study. So since using Birdie, uh, this one partner agency happened to streamline um, the onboarding process of um, a, a care recipient coming back from hospital. So with here, they would be able to liaise um, directly with the GP or the health professional once this person was released from hospital to understand what kind of medication changes required, any kind of new medication schedules, um, and making sure that they got the name right, the right dose. They would take that image uh, or that documentation, upload it directly to Birdie, um, and then build out that new schedule. Again, using the NHS DMD database to make sure it was consistent as possible. Um, but then again, once that care recipient was in the fold, um, you know, after um, including and recording those doses, would use our EMAR to audit um, any kind of trends in the administration of that medication, if there were any missed doses. Um, and then um, using Birdie Analytics, our reporting functionality, use this to review any kind of data and overall trends in um, the accuracy and the administration of that medication itself. Um, so ultimately they were able to take all of this um, evidence into place and when the inspection came, showcase that they were meeting um, not only the S4 Chloe, but they were well-led in terms of evidencing that care and, um, and keeping that safeguarding at the core of what they're doing. And I will just skip this one for the sake of time and go into the last but not least being well led. So when it comes to the first four Chloe's that we went through, they obviously were core to the delivery of, of care around a particular care recipient. So, you know, keeping your clients and your care recipients at the core of everything you do. Now, when it comes to well led, this is going to be all about you. So looking at, you know, your business, your staff, um, and taking a, a bit of self-reflection, if you will, about how, how um, you're performing, what processes you have in place um, that's, that are effectively well-led in this case. Um, so the way the CUC says this here, and again, I'll read this quote, um, is that the leadership management and governance of the organization make sure it's providing high quality care that's based around your individual needs and that it encourages learning and innovation and that it promotes a fair and open, um, an open and fair culture. So that is with the longest quote here. But again, this is really going to be core to, to you as an agency and you as a, a care business here. So let's break this down and see what this really means. So when it comes to the well-led Chloe, inspector really wants to see, and we'll go through this one by one, evidence of auditing. So um, again, this uh, all of the information that you've been collecting for evidence as the other Chloe's is, is, is going to be a way to, um, to evidence here, right? All of the evidence that you're documenting and all of the information that you're inputting into your system or your software is going to be centralized uh, and manifest in, in, and used uh, here as well. So when it comes to auditing, whether it's reviewing your care plans, auditing the delivery of your care, auditing your medication, you know, what's going to be core here is showcasing as a business, you have all those processes in place from an organizational standpoint to audit different areas of your business. So again, be it visit punctuality, be it medication, be it the absence that are raised, you're going to want to showcase that you have the processes in place um, to, to review and showcase the steps um, that have been taken um, um, and the changes that have been made to each of those areas of your business or each of those um, areas of the delivery of your care. The other thing that's going to be key is really clear documentation. So um, a clear statement of values and purpose for your business. So what is your mission statement? Who are you are as a business? Does your team know that? Is this like your marching um, kind of um, call for, um, for you as an agency? Um, you're also going to want to showcase a staff handbook. So does your team have all the information in place to effectively do the job? Are they set up for success? Do they have an understanding of the training that they need to have? Do they have resources if they aren't trained to, to go ahead and um, you know, get certified? Do they have contact details in case they need to speak to leadership or their team manager? Um, and what is their guidance on you know, company software or policy? And are they on, um, you know, do they have everything that they need there? Um, a clear kind of manual. 
The other thing that you really want to showcase is development. So are you keeping staff development and training at the core of what you're doing as an agency? So are you, uh, do you have a clear onboarding process for new team members? And in that onboarding process, are you thinking through what they want to get out of, um, you know, their, their journey with you? I.e., you know, for instance, let's say you have a junior care professional coming into your agency. Are you having that conversation with them? Hey, you know, you know, where do you want to go? Where do you see yourself growing within this profession? Um, what kind of steps can we, can we take and document to get you there? Um, or do you have a particular interest in, um, you know, understanding a particular service type? Do you want to get more so into um, dementia care? You know, identifying what are the interests and in professional kind of development plans that someone new to your staff has. And again, on top of that, are you promoting? Um, do you have proof of in-house promotion? Um, do you have recognition for your team in place? Showcasing again that you know you care and are so happy with the amazing work that they're doing, and that you're recognizing them for the amazing work that they're doing for for your care agency as a whole. Um, and then, last but not least, icing on the cake again. But examples of, of each of those things that I just talked about. So whether you have proof uh, proof of that promotion, um, proof of being able to you know, communicate with leadership or managers, um, whether it's a, a WhatsApp group or a regular phone call. At Bernie, we happen to use Slack. Um, but, um, but yeah, just clear kind of stories and examples that will showcase you know, that you're keeping um, staff development, documentation, and auditing processes at the core of what you're doing as an agency. Perfect. So the one thing that I would really, really recommend is having some kind of reporting um, tool for you to dive into improvements and evidence um, data um, and kind of trends in your care to a CQC or local authority. So when inspection times comes, you're able to visually showcase um, the, the core elements across your business, but be it visit punctuality, be it medication tasks um, that showcase what are the trends, what is the, the quality of the care that is being delivered, am I taking the steps needed to, to improve if I'm noticing that you know, a particular branch of mine has a low visit punctuality rate, um, and am I able to showcase that over a three-month time period, I was able to increase that visit punctuality. You know, being able to have that kind of um, visual proof point or that data at the ready, um, you know, is going to be really, really key here. And with that, it also showcased that you're able to, to share, um, share those reports um, and, and um, you know, in, I guess, facilitate that environment of learning as well within your team, i.e., you know, this particular branch happens to be doing this really effectively. You know, why don't you guys talk or you all talk through what steps you're finding really successful um, when it comes to, um, you know, being on time for a visit or ensuring that, um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, checking off all of my medication tasks and making sure that that record is really, really accurate here. So again, it, it serves very multiple purposes, but here, you know, having that kind of database of, of really strong data and insights is going to be um, core here, um, but also being able to facilitate that shared learnings and that kind of um, um, that culture of improvement and, and self-learning and sharing is going to be really, really core here. Um, the one thing that is also really important when it comes to being a well-led agency, um, but also when it comes to showcasing the auditing processes that you have in place, the CQC will oftentimes ask for um, uh, evidence or audit trails specific to an individual recipient of care. So the one thing that I would really, really recommend, whether it's no matter what system that you have in place or what strategy you have in place, is that you're documenting a central record for each of your recipients of care and being able to surface that really quickly. So information such as visits that have been completed, alerts or concerns that have been raised, i.e. you know, an accident or medication hasn't been recorded. Um, you really wanna be able to quickly and centrally surface that information. Um, using Verdi as an example, we're about to release something called Client Feed, which is going to be a centralized hub for you to find all of the information about the care um, delivered for any individual recipient of care. So going into their um, profile, clicking into all of the alerts and visit logs that have been recorded for them, but also a place to record and view any kind of third party or non-visit interaction, such as complaints, compliments, or general notes. So again, no matter if it's with Birdie or another, again, would really, really recommend that you're setting yourself up for success by being able to either quickly pull this information together for each of your care recipients or trying to build that central database now. 
So I know this has been a lot and I know it's been a bit overwhelming. Um, and I know the last year has been hard, but when it comes to CQC guidance and requirements, um, the expectations have not been lowered. And the CQC, as we know, is continuing to evolve. Um, and we know that we need to be on the lookout for changes to Chloe's um, and, and the requirements there. So we will definitely be vigilant to those changes um, and keep you updated. But um, we're really committed to building out a new suite of auditing tools that will involve and um, you know look to, to look to grow with those changing requirements. So on the lookout, um, stay on the lookout for that. You can look at our public roadmap to see this um, if you're interested. But I just wanted to thank you so, so much for your time today um, and really, really appreciate, um, you know, spending your, your valuable lunch break with us. Um, the one thing that I do really want to end on um, is that we hope that we've made this overrolling process a bit more manageable, a bit more um, easy to understand. I think, yes, there are a lot of moving pieces. And the thing to understand is that no matter if you're on paper, you're in a different software, you're using Birdie. You know, we hope you walk away knowing that by constantly documenting, constantly monitoring, constantly tracking progress, but also keeping these things at the back of your mind um, will go a long way when walking into any inspection. And that if you do this and you set yourself up for success and you do this document and you form these good habits, you know, that's going to go a long way to taking the stress out of preparing for and evidencing your care. Um, and that you'll feel ready no matter if an inspection is going to happen tomorrow and someone gives you a ring and says, hey, I'm, I want you to to be ready for this. Um, so again, hopefully this has taken a bit more of, um, has been a bit more calming for you and I really, really appreciate your time. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and if not, we can be in touch. Yes. Okay. There are a couple of questions, but please keep them coming. Um, this has been so good, uh, Sabrina. Really, really excited about. Um, <clears throat> Debbie, if you're still online, Debbie had a couple of questions. So. The first one, and I think this is very specific um, to the Birdie platform, how do you access, uh, access Q-score summary? Yeah, definitely. So this is going to be a report that goes out monthly to you um, if you're a Birdie partner. So if you have your um, account, if you are an existing Birdie partner and you have an account manager, if you get in touch with them, they'll be able to showcase how you access that. Um, and, um, and you'll be able to, to track across five different areas, such as call monitoring, visit punctuality, medication, um, and you'll be rated a score for each of those sections. So you'll see, hey, I'm actually lower on this, but doing really well on this. Um, so yeah, if you, if you um, I'll write your name down and um, if you don't get in touch, I'll make sure that your, care, um, your uh, account manager gets in touch with you. Super. Um, so Debbie also had another another questions, but I think this kind of I can as well support on this because this is about birdie and not about birdie. So what is actual evidence? So what do you mean evidence? So if you go through this process of the CQC uh, inspection, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that they want kind of two things. It's almost like you need to build this case study, you need to build this story to prove to prove an answer. So for example, if someone asks you like, how do you ensure that you never miss your visits and when visits are missed, how do you, um, how do you, um, you know, tackle them? The first thing that you can do is like answer questions like, we constantly monitor if visits are held via QR code check-ins and checkouts. Um, in the case of Birdie, you can use QR codes and, and geo, geo check-in. So you create the narrative, you type that answer. And then you can pull the data from, from the system or that's kind of your proof point is the actual proof. On average, you know, 90, 99% of our visits during the past three months all happen within 15 minutes uh, of their expected start time. You know, different councils, different thresholds as well in, in terms of that. And then what you can build is, and I know this is why it takes so much to evidence, and that's why you need the information at, at, the, um, at your fingertips, is because then what really kind of brings it to life is you usually write a story. So for example, uh, Sabrina, one of my uh, service users, um, uh, uh, the, ca the carer that was supposed to be there, you know, called in sick very, very last minute, an alert was raised, and this is what I did. And straight away within, I don't know, 20 minutes after, this is what we did. We put a system in places. If, if a person, if a carer is not feeling well, they need to notify us the day before, uh, or even if not fully off sick, but just kind of give, give a heads up. And that's what builds you, your case studies. Uh, Sabrina, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add onto this, yeah. but they are, sorry, right. one last point. 
one last point. So for example, in systems like Birdie into the analytics report, you can download them. So you can actually provide kind of that, that evidence. And we're working with, uh, with better tools and a better auditing system as well. It's gonna be live uh, quite soon. Sorry, Sabine, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I thought that was perfect. I was gonna go into part two of Debbie's answer about the specific kind of alerts evidence uh, yeah. when you were done. Yeah, I'm done. Perfect. Yeah. So there are a couple of different ways, Debbie, you could either walk directly through the alerts manager um, um, for, um, for your branch or your agency and walk through that as a tab. There's also, um, you're able to download that raw data um, into a PDF form. Um, but equally, if you are using Birdie Analytics, you're able to, to showcase and track um, alerts, responsiveness reports as well, um, which again, if, if you don't have access to Birdie Analytics, your account manager can walk you through and give you a demo of that as well. Super. So the next question is first, uh, I'm going to, um, Michelle, I think, yeah, Michelle is the next one. Can I confirm how many staff per agency have access to Bernie Analytics? Yep. So you can get multiple licenses depending on how many users you'd like. So if you're going to, let's say you have multiple users that you'd like to have Bernie Analytics, you would just get a different license for each of those users. Um, so Shannon, do First starts with a compliment, which is always nice. Sabrina, great presentation. Thank the second you. question is, um, is the CPT inspection pro uh, process of evidencing all records and proved strictly digital? Are document imprints also required as evidence? So I would say, again, um, document any documentation and evidence here is going to be critical. So if you're paper-based, you can document and, and surface this in a paper-based way. But again, there is a push in, from the NHS and in the CQC to move um, your processes to digital. So again, you know, if, if you are paper-based now, you know, being able to showcase that you are making that progress and moving into a more digital strategy is going to be key, especially over the next couple of years. Um, but it is a combination. Um, and it doesn't have to be all digital currently. Super. Um, Jeanette, I think I might need a bit more information. Um, just what, what is the tier one, two, three? I think just to give us a bit more context. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, I think as well, uh, Shana Du had seen that some inspection requirements are related can a particular evidence serve or be demonstrated as many times for related requests? Yeah, yeah. I, I, go ahead. yeah, go ahead, Sabrina. No, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say for that one, I think, like I said, yeah, the, the expectation is that there is going to be overlap for, for Chloe. So, um, you know, being able to have as much data as possible across those areas and being able, when asked to, to surface a particular area or evidence a particular thing, um, you know, you may need to use something multiple times, but again, it's gonna be dependent upon what this inspector is, is reviewing with you and, and asking you. Super. Um, any more questions? Okay, um, I just have a couple more things to add. Like we built this amazing CQC hub with all the resources, it has the worksheets that talk pretty much on like, it has the fundamentals of what Sabrina described today. If you click on the link that I just put on the chat, you'll find access to all of them. A full, fully fledged CQC ebook that takes you through in very much detail about everything. The worksheets, if you're going through a, an inspection process, you can download them. They're like the second link that you'll find on that page. And I also wanna say that we are taking this type of webinars on the road. So if you're based either in London or Manchester, we are coming your way with an in-person kind of workshop. Um, we will be sending the links to this out soon to everyone that registered as well. And we're also launching a CQC certification. At the end of this webinar, once you close the page, there's a survey, but if you scroll down to the last question of the survey, it asks, do you wanna participate and kind of be the first to know about this CQC ready certification? Again, this doesn't guarantee you an outstanding, this just guarantees that you know all the step-by-step -step. and it's a very educational, uh, it will be a very educational course. You will have homework to do, you'll have quizzes, text, so you just feel more confident when the CQC comes in. Again, whether you're a Birdie customer or not Birdie customer, our vision is to improve the lives of older adults, whether the, the, the care agency uh, provides um, the service is using Birdie or not. But really like, um, yeah, just, just essentially kind of 
uh, we are providing as much resource um, as, as possible on this. Cool. I think I think that's it. Um, Thanks I think, so much. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Over 100 people attended this webinar, and we know how many of you are so busy right now, so we really appreciate it. Yes, recording will be sent. Yes, we'll be sending the slides. Uh, but thank you so much. Hope you have an amazing week ahead of you. And uh, I'll see you at the next webinar. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.